One of the first things I think that is helpful for a lot of people to do is to really get in touch with what their body is telling them the biofeedback of their body. Like you eat something, notice the cause and effect, say 60 minutes later, 90 minutes later. And if you have a huge energy crash, for example, that can be a sign that it wasn't compatible with your body or you ate too much, sometimes too little. The sun is just such a, a powerful thing. And um, he talked about like the Tropic of Cancer, like the areas where the sun is you know, pretty ideal. So we went down to uh, Cabo San Lucas. I think I really felt um, just this nice, peaceful energy that, that came from the sun in that area. It was, it was phenomenal. First thing that I noticed was that it was really high. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. I'm eating clean. Why would my blood sugar be high? And I quickly discovered something that we've all heard and that it took me some personal experience to actually believe. And that is that stress can profoundly influence blood sugar. Hey everybody, it's Reagan Archibald here at Unreasonable Health. And today um, I've got a really exciting guest on, Nick Urban. Uh, many of you, uh, you know, we've shared the podcast episode that he and I did together where he interviewed me and um, we had so much fun. I said, Nick, will you please come and introduce yourself to our amazing people over here at East West? And Nick was so gracious to uh, accept the invitation. And uh, Nick is somebody who uh, he's got, if you go to nickurban.me, you'll be able to find out all about him. But he is a, a significant uh, individual in the world of biohacking. Not only is he taking ancient practices similar to what we do and combining those with some of the most innovative uh, tools for increasing your productivity, your performance, your mental health, everything when it comes to your own personal growth plan, um, Nick is your go-to. And so um, he is prominent uh, in the field of biohacking. He also has, ex like, you know, he's he's really testing the boundaries when it comes to, uh, you know, some of the emerging technology. So uh, I'm excited for our conversation today, Nick, and welcome to Unreasonable Health. Thanks, Regan. And that was a very warm welcome. I appreciate you. I had a great time chatting last time as well. One small correction I will make is that instead of biohacking, I am a proponent of what I call bioharmonizing. And it's very similar to biohacking, but instead of looking for the quick fixes, the shortcuts that usually work over a short time horizon, bioharmony takes the opposite approach and it works with the body to amplify the signals and make long-term effective changes. Oh, I love that. Well, and and um, I think uh, bioharmonization um, is so much better because uh, the world in the world of quick fixes, um, why not get your biology harmonized? I mean, that's that is it. So, um, yeah. So one of the things that I really appreciate about you is you're someone who's always learning and um, you're someone who is is young, but you're wise beyond your years. But what are some of the best books that you've read that have allowed you to, you know, create this term bioharmony? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I do a lot of reading. It's partially what I attribute my success to, my limited success so far. But I like to look at information that will expose me to different perspectives. And so early on, I found Tim Ferriss and his concepts of meta-learning, or like, how do you improve the one skill that will translate to all other skills? If you can get really good at the process of learning, then you can pick up information, whether it's for your relationships, it's for your career, it's for your sports, whatever it is. If you get really good at learning, you can become better at any of these other fields. So I started diving deep into that and learning techniques to improve memory, to learn faster. And using that, then I looked for health-wise, some of the older systems, because like our current approach, the Western paradigm, it is limited and it there's a lot of contradictory information. It seems like one week coffee is a super drink. The next it's a villain, cholesterol, same thing. Uh, Alzheimer's and dementia, also the same thing where it, it seems like we understand exactly what causes it. And then new research comes out and shows that it's 
limited in our understanding. So I like to look at things like the what I call, not what I call, the hermetic principles, which go a level deeper and try and figure out and like tease out the core patterns of life. And so like the like ryth- rhythms, that's one. Uh, there's a bunch of different principles like that that are, explain so much of what we experience in our daily life. So, uh, yeah, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, hormetic, what that term means, um, how would you uh, define like hormetic activities or hormesis? So those are two separate things. Hormetic is one thing, and these are hermetic principles. And the hermetic principles were coined by, I think it was a Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I yeah, see. Yeah. Okay. And there's there's a book called the Kybalion, which details the like seven, I believe, laws it is of the Hermetic principles. And then hormesis is a different concept entirely. And that's like to summarize, just like the concept of a the right amount of something will trigger a biological response that's beneficial. And if you go much beyond that, the dose determines the poison, basically. So something that's good in a small dose will be detrimental in a high dose. Yeah, that's okay. Excuse me. I'm, I'm glad I clarified that. So, and, and, uh, you, you've had your own, um, I mean, it, p- part of why you got into this, this whole world is you had your own health crisis. I mean, almost insulin dependent, maybe you could talk to us about, you know, kind of your own health journey and how you really became such a ferocious learner. And now somebody who really wants to transform the health of as many people as possible. Yeah. So it started for me back in high school. I was an athlete playing three sports in high school and I thought I was the pinnacle of health. I was very strong and I looked good. But then the issue became when I went to my doctor and he checked out my fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and it was very high. I was bordering pre-diabetic and they said that if I maintained that for much longer, I would need insulin. And to me, it made no sense. I had like the, the USDA food pyramid on my wall, following it to a T. And that was not turning me into the picture of health, at least internally. And then the more I dug into the research and try to f- decode what all this was, I discovered that the symptoms I assumed that everyone experienced, such as gas, bloating, feeling super lethargic after meals, like a huge crash where I just wanted to curl up for the rest of the day. Those weren't normal. And after I tried different things, I began fasting occasionally. I cleaned up what I was consuming. I realized that I had not allergies, but intolerances to dairy. And I had, at the time I was drinking a couple gallons of milk per week and eating a bunch of yogurt and had like a very high dairy consumption. So I started trying to eliminate certain foods and I noticed that those made improvements. I felt better. And then I also came across the world of dietary supplements. And those were more on the ergogenic side for performance. And I started using those after heavy research and saw a pretty profound improvement to my sports game. And from there, I saw the same improvements in the classroom, which was surprising. I started taking creatine monohydrate, for example, and not only was I able to like lift more and recover faster from that, but then I realized that my memory was a little bit better. It wasn't mm-hmm. outstandingly better, but it made a small little difference. And I realized that if you do the right things for your biology, they can transform not only your physical performance, but your mental performance, your health, and your long-term vitality. And did you start, uh, I mean, did you share this with some of your mm. your teammates, like your rugby teammates? And like, how quick did you start? Uh, I mean, because when I got into nutrition, I was about 16 and I gave my whole basketball team eight grams of vitamin C. I'm like, we're going to crush it. I read this article on it and, the, and it's really good for endurance, but I gave us all loose stools. And so it was kind of my first failed attempt to uh, help someone in their health journey. But how soon did you start doing stuff like that? Yeah, I began sharing with my teammates at about the same age in high school also. And then in college, it really started taking off. People were turning to me all the time, like asking me to to design custom supplement stacks for them, help them with nootropics. A lot of people around me were using study drugs. And from like some of the neuroscience classes I was taking, I quickly realized that I didn't want to take those. And I wanted to find other things that could give me a little leg up 
and help me. And I found some of those things. I used them. People were wondering what they were. I would explain how it worked to them. And of course, give them all the proper disclaimers that it's for research only and to do your own research. But yes, that was sharing what I was learning has always been a big part of my process because it's one thing to read a book and to really understand, think you understand. And it's another to be able to read a book, digest the information, assimilate the information and be able to actually apply that when it comes to when it, when it counts. Yeah. It, um, yeah. I, I know uh, early on uh, that, you know, Jim quick, uh, he's the, the, the memory guy, just awesome. I took one of his courses and he's like, the fastest way to learn something is to go teach it. And, um, and so I love that. I've always applied that. And, and I think that's where, you know, when you're naturally enthusiastic about something, you just, you want to share it. Even if you're maybe, uh, you know, you're, you know, our intentions were great. I'm sure there was some of the stacks that you recommended that probably didn't, <laughs> may not have been as effective as they could have, would be now. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And on the topic of learning also, that reminds me of Richard Feynman, who is a, I think, Nobel Prize winning physicist, yeah. maybe not Nobel yeah. Prize, but he is a Nobel. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And he was very adamant about teaching as a form of learning. And there was a lot, of, a lot of others like him. If you study the polymaths, you figure out what they have in common, then you can work on developing those skills. Yeah, I think that's great. And I also like the definition that, uh, you know, learning is a change of behavior. And if you, if you haven't changed your behavior, you haven't really learned something. Because yeah. a lot of people read a lot of books and they the books are in the mind, but they're not embodied and they haven't made big changes. So what would you say the biggest thing that you've changed uh, for the good has been in the last 10 years? Hmm. I, For me, the biggest thing would be to not just blindly accept information because it comes from an authority, whether it's a podcast, an interview, it's a book, it's a course, to actually like take that and look to both sides, what the one proponent's saying, what the opposition is saying and then like letting myself sit with both of those and just feel both sides try to steel man both sides and really make sure that i'm not just i'm having like a more broad perspective and i'm understanding the whole thing before i just take a a stance and then also once i take that stance to realize it's where i currently stand but at any point that could shift if a bunch of new evidence comes out i'm not going to pigeonhole myself into dogma yeah i think that's great because uh you know you you always have to look at both sides if you know there's there's this thing in medicine called the anchoring bias and so are you familiar with that where you know our first and our first diagnosis you know if i'm like if i read labs and i'm like this person has thyroid issues or whatever and i've i've had to learn to just like okay put that on the side and maybe that is and then have some debate about why it may not be and um that's a that's a yeah, that's a good principle you've learned in the last 10 years so so if somebody's looking at and and one of the reasons i wanted to bring you on is because I wanted to help um, our audience like really learn how to assess information. I think you've done a great job at that, you know, bringing in uh, a lot of the science, but also not being closed off to, uh, you know, more of the ancient traditions, you know, whether that's uh, shamanic medicine, um, Ayurvedic medicine, but um, what are some things, uh, some pieces of advice you could give people who are, you know, maybe just entering into the world of, you know, uh, you know, transforming their health or the world of, um, you know, peptides or uh, nootropics? But w- what are some some things that some advice you would give them in, in their learning and research process? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for learning and research, it's again to find sources that can help you break down what it is. Cause if you go straight to PubMed and you look at a study, even if you know what all the words mean, it can be a lot more complicated than that. And there's a lot of biases, as you mentioned, the anchoring bias that doesn't just apply to medicine that applies across the board. I first learned about that when I was working at a startup and it was a sales tech startup and the salespeople would always try and anchor their prospects to get the best possible price for the software. And so like being aware of the different cognitive biases that might be influencing your thinking and influencing whatever it is that you're studying. That's a big one that I always 
I'm wary of whenever I'm reading something because there's even some research that the the study lead, whoever's actually conducting research, if they hold very strong beliefs that something will or will not work, that alone influences the outcome of the study. Yeah. <laughs> well, it goes back to like the Heisenberg principle, right? Is it a particle or, or is it a wave? And it's like, well, it depends on the observer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and and the biases are, are I mean, that it's funny you, you talk about them, but, you know, you and I are biased towards the same kind of thing. We think, um, you know, there's certain like techniques and tools and there's new medicine that are, that seem to be better than other stuff. But, um, but I guess what can people do when it comes to, uh, you know, I have a lot of our clients who are like, you know, um, you know, I, my brother's a doctor. He thinks what, what you guys do is just like, it's so far out there. Um, and, or they may even say that themselves. They're like, well, before I do anything uh, on my own, I really want to, you know, talk to my doctor about this, but what, what uh, would you talk to them? Uh, you know, what, what kind of advice would you share with them to help, you know, think of the bias that their doctor may have versus, you know, their brother or what they want to do with their own personal journey? One of the first things I think that is helpful for a lot of people to do is to really get in touch with what their bio, their body is telling them the biofeedback of their body. Like you eat something, notice the cause and effect, say 60 minutes later, 90 minutes later. And if you have a huge energy crash, for example, that can be a sign that it wasn't compatible with your body or you ate too much, sometimes too little. And you can get a lot of information about like how something lands on you and in you. So that's one that like, it's a practice, like becoming more in touch with uh, the cues your body gives you. That's a big one for me. And then also to run some like small but safe self experiments. So you get the hang of being your own advocate, your own primary care physician, because everyone has their biases. Your doctor will have their biases. I'll have my biases. You have your biases. And they all have their value. But like ultimately, what matters is the effect on you. So if you're able to run some self experiments and notice what's working, what isn't working, you can also listen to your doctor and you can do your own research and do some combing through the literature. You can ask around people in your network who have experience with this kind of stuff and they can direct you to resources while you're still being aware that there's going to be biases in everything you read. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gotta love it. Yeah. These little hidden, hidden things, but, um, and you've done a lot of things. Uh, one of my, my teachers, my Japanese teacher, um, she used to say that your body is your laboratory. And, mm -hmm. and so I think from an early uh, stage in my career, you know, this was 25 years ago, I really learned like if, if I got sick or if I had pain, it was like, this is awesome. Now I can figure out how to fix myself. And, you know, I had Hashimoto's and that was mm -hmm. what led me into more natural medicine and was misdiagnosed. And, you know, and nobody uh, was gluten free 25 years ago. And when I got off gluten, I felt so much better and, you know, and dairy similar to, to your experience. But um, but uh, what are some of the experiments that you've done with your body that have worked really well? Because I know you've done fasting, you've done, you know, the carnivore diet, you know, you're big into Wim Hof. But, you know, what what's what's some of the things that have stuck? Man, well, for me, what one habit that I really like is to make a log of what it is that I'm doing and like how I'm feeling every day and just keep mm -hmm. track of these things because I, I find that if I put attention on it and I make it a recurring practice, then I'm able to control it and influence it a lot more than I could if I just go through my day and then all of a sudden I realize at the end that I was unhappy the whole time or I had these issues. And also this let, lets me go back and discover patterns. I can say if I go to bed at say 1130 PM, then I ha the next day I'm sad more often, or I don't mm -hmm. perform quite as well in the gym or my resting heart rate is higher. And so my recovery isn't as good. There's a lot of different ways you can like, triangulate this data and correlate the data to figure out little lifestyle tweaks to make. And I've been using, I wear an aura ring. It's a wearable that tracks your sleep and recovery. I like it more for the recovery data than the sleep. And that one was big, especially in the beginning, because it helped me like tease out all these factors that were influencing my biological state. And now I don't use it so much for tracking sleep and recovery and checking it first thing in the morning. 
but I wear it anyway to passively collect data. And then also I will use it as a second voice. So if I'm wondering if I should push this last set when I'm working out or I should ease off a little bit, I'll check internally to see how I feel. And if I feel worn down, then I won't. And mm -hmm. if I'm feeling worn down, then I'll also check the ring to see what the ring says. But I also don't just blindly trust it to make, to base my decisions off of, because I've seen more times than I can count that the aura ring or any of the other wearables I've used will be inaccurate. So I can't base my decisions off of that data. Isn't it frustrating? I, I, you know, I, I would just obsess over my aura ring and I'd have a big mountain bike plan with all these, these dudes. And I'm like, no, my HRV is so low today. I can't do it. <laughs> it just was ridiculous. But then I'd go do the, the ride and I'd crush it. And it was like, yeah. So, I, I, you know, someday we'll have like really perfect metrics. We'll have little nanobots in our bodies and those nanobots will, you know, we'll have the smart toilets and we'll know all the data. Uh, and then, uh, but the real key will be uh, sorting through the data, which I think yeah. will take, uh, uh, no matter how much AI we have, I think uh, biology is, is, uh, you know, Occam's razor. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, biology is just like, infinitely more complex than what we make it once you uh, open up all the variables, but um, we're, we're trying. That's, that's why we do experiments. But yeah. Um, so one of yours is, uh, you know, you use your aura ring, you make sure that you're not pushing yourself beyond where you want to be uh, or where you, you know, as far as the gym goes, cause you know, Hey, tomorrow I want to be able to show up and do the leg day or whatever. Um, what are some other things that have stuck with you? Some of these habits. I like to do lifestyle audits every a couple of times a year. And for the last most recent one I did, I got a continuous glucose monitor and I've done this a handful of times. I put it on my arm and it stays there for, I think it's two weeks. And every 15 minutes, it gives me a reading of my glucose and my blood sugar. And the first thing that I noticed was that it was really high. And I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense. I'm eating clean. Why would my blood sugar be high? And I quickly discovered something that we've all heard and that it took me some personal experience to actually believe. And that is that stress can profoundly influence blood sugar. And so after I did that, I realized, okay, it's, I should add some more parasympathetic activities into my routine, some breathing routines, getting outside more and taking breaks. And pretty quickly within, I think it was a day or so, I saw the levels come down and normalize. And it was a good reminder to me that a lot of things that you take for granted that you don't think apply to you probably still apply to you. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. That's uh, I get on these streaks where, um, you know, I'm, it, whether I'm planning on, you know, like a, a new event. And so I'm putting my, my slides together or I'm you know preparing for like one of our master classes and I don't follow my own advice on like the three, two, one, like stop, stop eating three hours before bed. I'm pretty darn good at that. Stop drinking water two hours before that's easy, but it's the, it's the focus work and like the, you know, the blue lights, the hour before bed is my hardest. And um, yeah, just last night I was like, okay, you know, I, I had this big research idea and I'm like, don't do it tonight, do it in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I slept so good last night because I just followed my own advice and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's yeah. funny how hard it is. Yeah. Um, tell me about sun gazing. You, you do uh, some sun gazing most mornings. Yeah. So that's an Ayurvedic practice. And the way they recommend it is you only sun gaze when the UV index is zero, meaning there's no UV. So you don't damage your eyes. And the way I do it is I go out and if I can see the sun rise or sunset, that's ideal. But for the first like 15 minutes of the day, I will go out, I'll ground myself, I'll stand on some some grass or bare earth if I can find it, or even better, a body of water, I'll swim in that. And I will look over to the light. And the way they recommend doing it is to gradually build up. And you start off at zero seconds, then you go to 15 seconds of looking at the sun. And when the UV index is zero, for, so for the first 15 minutes a day, last 15 minutes a day, it's key to make sure the UV index is zero. If it hurts at all, you don't do it. And then you just look at the sun for 15 seconds, first day, 30 seconds, the second day, and you gradually build on in 15 second increments. And 
I started doing this when I was living in New York City and I found that that was like one of the fastest ways I could shift in a parasympathetic and I felt my whole body mm-hmm. relax and it puts you in like a, a trance-like state. It's hard to really hard to describe, but it it's like a practice that I looked forward to because it was like so different than anything else I did. And in theory, it's supposed to help your vision. It's a spiritual practice. So I don't always have access to the sunrise or sunset now, but it's a treat when I have that ability. And now I'm up to like five minutes or so. Jeez. And so I will, I'll, I'll do that. And I'm again, very cautious to make sure I don't actually blind myself or hurt my eyes in any way. Wow. Five minutes. Um, I heard of this really fascinating interview by uh, Dr. Jack uh, Kruko. I can't remember his last name exactly. Bruce? Caruse, yes. Uh, former yeah, brain surgeon. And um, yeah, he was talking about some of those same principles in the mitochondria and how, you know, the, the sun is just such a, a powerful thing. And um, he talked about like the Tropic of Cancer, like the areas where the sun is, you know, pretty ideal. And it's funny because I heard that interview and it was um, on a Rick Rubin's podcast uh, Tetra Gamma. Have you, have you heard that, that episode? Uh-uh. You would love it, Nick. You got to check it out. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we went down to, uh, Cabo San Lucas oh, yeah. and then we went North of there, which we're right by the Tropic of Cancer uh, in, uh, Pescadero, uh, oh. Pescadero. And, um, it, it was actually super energizing. I was like, is this just placebo because I heard him talk about it or do I really feel energized here? But I think I really felt, um, just this nice, um, like, like, peaceful energy that that came from the sun in that area it was it was phenomenal yeah it's very hard to describe and one thing that's important is to not wear glasses or contacts or anything which changes the angle of the refraction of the i think it's refraction of the light and it's interesting now that dr andrew huberman and others are talking about that just how important morning sunlight is and they harp on it over and over again. It's like one of his top things that he recommends to everyone. Yet if we trace that back, it's like an old practice, an Ayurvedic practice of like 5,000 or more years. Yeah. Well, and um, Andrew Huberman is uh, on the podcast with Rick Rubin and, and Jack Cruz. And so um, it's it's really fascinating. Uh, but um, but check it out. So the other thing that you, you, you do is um, the Wim Hof Method. And so uh, it's been hot in Austin. You've had, you're telling me before we started 45 days of uh, weather above a hundred. And uh, there is a little bit of, there's quite a bit of humidity in Austin too. So, um, so are you jumping in ice baths over the last 45 days or what, what have you done to tolerate that? Yeah. So actually I do something that might seem strange. And I also use the sauna. I use the sauna year round, but even in the summer, And I find that when I use the sauna and I go in in 190 degrees Fahrenheit for like 18 minutes, then when I come out, I have better tolerance to the 105 degrees outside. And I also like to combine that with an ice bath and I'll do that for between three and eight minutes, depending on how I'm feeling. And if I worked out before I work out before, I'll do it a little shorter, but it's great for recovery. It's also a natural nootropic and it just makes me feel good and better tolerate the heat. So those are some of my things that I like to do in the summer, especially I'll do it in the winter also, but I change the timing and the duration of each. Uh, and that's fascinating because I found that by doing um, cold plunges and ice baths and even cold showers in the winter here in Utah, um, you know, I started doing that like maybe eight to 10 years ago it was a four hour body whenever tim ferris's four hour body came, i think i was actually 2010 so it was like 13 years ago and uh, i just found that the winters were much more tolerable tolerable it's it's funny when you when you just ramp it up you're like oh you think it's hot outside we'll jump into the sauna it's 90 degrees hotter <laughs> yeah yeah and then also like i like to couch this in some of the ancestral wisdom and my background, I don't have formal training in it, but from my own studies is more in Ayurveda and like my constitutional type, they call Pitta, which is like the fiery, hot, like that kind of like intense personality. 
And so I will also consume like more cooling foods. I'll spend more time doing like cooling breath work as opposed to the stuff that would invigorate me more because like one way of viewing health is just the pursuit of balance. And if I'm already naturally hot and I'm in 105 degrees, it only makes things worse. And so then for me, adding in the cooling stuff makes me feel a lot better in the summertime. Yeah, I like that. And uh, anything that you uh, are doing right now, like as far as your nootropic stacks, like what does uh, day in the life of Nick Urban look like? Oh man, I'm constantly playing around with different nootropic stacks and I try to combine multiple ingredients together so that they have a synergy and they tend to work more effectively with fewer side effects when I combine them. But I have like a whole cabinet full of probably 100, 200 powders and pills and potions and everything that I I like to mix together in different proportions. I would say most consistently, I use a bunch of different adaptogenic herbs. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of them because of your background. But for me, I find that the adaptogens are noticeable enough that I continue to take them. And also they don't seem to have the side effects that some of the more potent nootropics that are now becoming popular have. Mm. And uh, if you look at some of the most dangerous nootropics, um, what would you say people should probably steer clear from, from the research you've done? Well, there's a lot that show potential, especially in like the nootropic peptides that I like. And there's also like very little human data, especially in human in, in healthy humans. So one that I have, and I haven't played around with as much, but I'm interested in playing around with is called dihexa. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you've heard of that. And Oh yeah. Yeah. I love dihexa. Yeah. It seems like it has a lot of promise. I haven't played around with it as much because I haven't seen all that much research. And I also want to make sure I'm doing it right. The right dosage, the right time, because with some of these things, if you're going to overclock your brain, you're going to make it work faster and more efficiently. You also want to be pushing yourself. You don't want to just be doing your normal routine and living in a complete comfort. You want to give yourself something to like strive towards that's out of the ordinary. And then with a lot of these also, the I hear very few people talking about the importance of recovery because you can think of it like a seesaw. If you're increasing your performance way up here, your recovery needs to go up also, or you're going to crash and burn at some point down the line. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a really good point because uh, nootropics, I find that if I use them, but I don't like really push myself in an exercise, um, like whether I go for a run or ride my mountain bike or push it really hard in the gym, uh, I, I don't really get the same benefits. And dihexa, dihexa is interesting because uh, originally, it was, uh, you know, as a pharmaceutical company funded it for uh, its properties with angiotensin. So mm-hmm. it was initially planned on uh, being used for a hypertensive medication. And they realized oh, it didn't really work for that. But people seem to really like the cognitive benefits. And they they also um, found that uh, in some of their Parkinson's patients who were in the, the, the trials, they actually had really favorable outcomes with it. And so, um, yeah, dihexa, you, it's oral or you can apply it right to your carotid artery. And um, it's, a, it's a great peptide. We have a lot of our clients who really uh, love it. But um, with a lot of these nootropics, at dihexa especially you want to get it from a compounding pharmacy where you know you're getting rid of any kind of contaminants because uh not all nootropics are created equal and especially when you go into like the uh the racetam family or you know nupap uh, mm-hmm. get it you know we just get it from uh you know great compounding pharmacies versus sources that might not uh have screened out all the heavy metals because a lot of the raw materials um, you know, aren't always safe for human consumption. Yeah. Especially when they're, when they're coming from certain countries and even if they have the certificate of analysis showing that it's clean, I sometimes still wonder about the authenticity and validity of those, if they're even real. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm with you. That's where we have uh cool pharmacists who can, um, check things for us. So, um, so, so some of your, you know, kind of your bio synergy, uh, the bio harmony, uh, you know, you, uh, you, you're not a fan of genetically modified food. Um, why is that? 
Because when I was doing the research into this, I was looking at like the potential downstream consequences. And it seems like there can be increased free radical production as a result of consuming it. And also there's, I think it's called horizontal gene transfer of when you consume certain things that the bacteria in the, in your gut can transfer, transfer that material into you. And that was one of the concerns with glyphosate, a, a huge pesticide herbicide, uh, active ingredient that is now under like billion dollar lawsuits because they said it was safer than water. That was their like marketing slogan. And then it turns out to human cells it is, but we have like three genomes that run the human body, the human genome, the mitochondrial genome and the microbiome genome. Yeah. And if it's not safe to the microbiome genome, it's not going to be safe to you in the long run. Yes. And, and glyphosate, um, it, we are, I've, I've spoken a lot about, uh, glyphosate and, and, uh, the damage that it can do, but, um, but yeah, so genetically modified food and pretty much anything in a package. <laughs> there's a reason why there's like the non GMO, like this is a non GMO food. It's actually really important. Um, shoes like you, uh, tell me what kind of shoes you typically wear. Do you wear shoes? <laughs> so I do wear shoes usually. Sometimes I don't, but around Austin, I for the, do for the most part. When I'm down near Cabo, I will walk around without shoes a lot of times. But when I'm here, I will wear Earth Runner sandals that are grounding sandals, or I'll wear barefoot slash minimalist sandals or shoes. And those have a what's it called? Zero drop arch, and it more closely mimics the way humans used to walk before shoes. Because when you're compressing your feet into a narrow toe box, it doesn't just change the shape of your foot, but it changes your proprioception where you're like contact with the ground. And it seems like it's a small thing, but your feet have tons of nerve fibers in them. And when you do that, you throw off your gait considerably. And when you have like the super boosted shoes, that's on the opposite side you're more likely to injure yourself because your body loses that ability to discern the right amount of force to apply to the ground. And when you take that off, when you have barefoot shoes, which are not technically barefoot, but they have like very small, a couple millimeters of padding between you and the ground, then it takes some time to transition into that. But once you do, you walk around. I used to have shin splints. I used to get Osgood slaughter, a bunch of different like overuse injuries. And since I transitioned, I don't know, seven years ago, I haven't had those flare up at all. Yeah. Well done. It, have you read the book born to run? I read part of it. It's, it's an interesting, I found it, it, it was, uh, yeah, I read that like 18 years ago, whatever, when it came out and it, it was like, I started using those Vibram, like um, basically barefoot running and it made a huge difference. Then I got into chi running and that helped mm. a ton. So um, I, I love that. I think it's really important. Um, you're not a fan, you're not a, a fan of mouthwash. You just like walking around a bad breath or. <laughs> <laughs> so well, actually going back to the, some of the other ancestral health practices, yep. uh, Ayurveda, I'm speaking mostly about that. They have certain things you do that, are good for your oral health that are not mouthwash. One of them is tongue scraping and you carry a lot of pathogenic bacteria and odor causing bacteria on your tongue. And you take a little tool, it's either, usually either copper or stainless steel and you scrape your tongue with that in the mornings and in the evenings, ideally. And when you do that, like that's, it was first studied in modern times for its ability to help with halitosis, I think it's called, which is bad breath. Yeah. And it, it's also used for a bunch of other things. And one of the interesting things that often flies under the radar is that when you scrape your tongue, your taste receptors have a have better contact with the food. And in theory, you get full faster from your food because you can taste it more accurately. And that sends better signals to your brain, to your gut, all over. Oh, that's, that's, the, that's one of them. And then other things I do, I oil pull. So yeah. I have some coconut oil or sesame seed oil, uh, and I will add a couple drops of essential oils to that. And then I'll swish that around. My, I'll swish that around my mouth for about 10 minutes in the mornings. And that freshens the breath up nicely without mouthwash. And the reason I don't like mouthwash is that 
a lot of our health begins in the mouth. I'm not the one to come up with that saying. That's pretty common in the functional circles. And when we're taking that mouthwash, we're killing both like the commensal bacteria, the good bacteria that are there to protect us. And we're not leveling the playing field because the pathogenic bacteria have a better ability to survive and thrive despite that. And so we're causing unknown amounts of harm by using that instead of some other alternatives. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And the the oil pulling is really nice. So you probably put like some peppermint oil, spearmint oil, I'd imagine. If you want to really ramp it up, you can put some oregano. We have this uh, Dr. Laurence uh, and our mm. good friends, and he has this uh, this uh, Boca Zen. Uh, so have you tried the Boca Zen? Yeah, I'm looking around. I have I have a bunch of his products. I've interviewed him, and his products are powerful. Yeah, his his book is in it. Uh, it carries a punch, um, but it's it's some great stuff. But um, but I think it's great because uh, you know you're going to get a lot more. Uh, you know, if, if you just think of your mouth uh, similar to the way you think about your gut, like you're not just going to be swallowing antibiotics all the time. And uh, you know that's essentially what mouthwash is is doing. Yeah. So um, so the other thing I, you know I, I wanted to touch on is uh, sunscreen. Um, what are your thoughts on sunscreen? My thoughts. Hmm. That's a a hot topic these days. I personally don't use much sunscreen. I try to get most of my sun exposure in, in the early morning and in the evening when the UV index is low. So it's less necessary then. Uh, I also like to increase my, as I call it, internal sunscreen. So I'll eat foods that are rich in melanin, such as mushrooms. I'll eat foods that are high in the antioxidant called astaxanthin. So like salmon and shrimp and that type, those types of food. And those help bolster the body's like natural defenses against UV radiation. And then I'll also use peptides like ones called melanotan. And that will help like increase the melanin in my skin so that I don't burn as easy. And there's a couple of books that are fascinating about melanin. I haven't dug into them, but I've came across some of the research in a book I was reading about how melanin is like very closely correlated with consciousness. And there's a bunch of books on it. I haven't actually dug into any of them, but it's an interesting theory. And the I think Sayer G's is one of the author's names. He was talking about mm-hmm. how melanin was one of the core drivers that let human humans become the dominant creatures that we've become. Wow. I got to look into that. That sounds fascinating because I love melanotan. I've used it for years because not a fan of sunscreen. And if you look at just the the incidences of skin cancer since we started applying sunscreen, it's just like through the roof. And so it's like maybe we should look at um, something else. So um, yeah, I think I think that's that's great. And and for those of you who you know, you, many of you have heard me talk about melanotan uh, plenty on this, but you can also add some GHK copper, mm-hmm. and that's another way of protecting the skin uh, because I'm outside all the time, and uh, you know, usually uh, like you, try to get out first thing in the morning. But um, on some of the mountain bike journeys or hikes, you know, four or five hours, and it's uh, you know one in the afternoon by the time you're done. So, so, but. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's a great way of, of uh, circumventing the, the damage from the sun is using some of these peptides. And speaking of peptides, what are your favorite peptides or what do you, what, which ones are you most interested in right now? Before we go to that, to add on to what you were just saying, I've seen some research that the incidence of melanoma is higher in indoor workers than those who work outdoors full time. So that goes to show that it's not as, clear cut as we were thinking. And when I do use sunscreen, like my hierarchy is like first to bolster my internal defenses and then to put on like layers if I can, which isn't always the most comfortable, but like a very lightweight long sleeve shirt will do wonders to protect the skin than like I say, say a sunscreen would. And then if I do use sunscreen, I'll try and use a mineral based like zinc oxide or titanium dioxide. I don't love those, but if I'm going to be out in the sun for a long time and I haven't built my so-called solar callus yet, those can help. Uh, I love that. Um, and I'm not surprised that, uh, you know, indoor workers having uh, greater levels of, 
melanoma than uh, people working outside. The sun's actually really good for us. And so I think it's easy to forget. And I love, I love the sun gazing you talked about. I think that's uh, really powerful because it's one of the things that we encourage our clients to do is every morning as the sun's coming up, get out in the sun, go for a walk, exercise outside, get your shirt off, you know, really uh, activate your mitochondria. Then it resets the melopsin receptors in your brain so that you get better melatonin production in the evening. And so it just, it, it's a way of resetting your circadian rhythms that are phenomenal. Yeah. And it also inoculates you against some late night blue light exposure, which we don't want because it interferes with melatonin production. So if you get your early morning light, then you are a little more immune to that late night light exposure. Yeah, love it. Well, um, and did you have any peptides you wanted to? Oh, yes. So the peptides I like, I like BPC. I don't use it all that often, but I have a form of oral BPC around here somewhere. And that's using BPC arginate, I think the form is. And uh, I think arginate form has like 90% bioavailability compared to the other form, the typical form, which is like only 10%. So the acetate, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 acetate, exactly. So I will use that more often because I can travel with it more easily. I use uh, melanotan. I have some GHK, GHKCU, the copper peptide that I haven't dug into. I, If I'm coming down with something, I will use LL37 and thymosin alpha-1. Nice. Yeah, I don't use those all that often, but if I need to, I used... I did a protocol of MOTC for mitochondria and energy maybe about two months ago. And I noticed a pretty profound uptick in my energy with that. And I found that it also paired nicely with certain nootropics. And I think we talked about this on my podcast, but with cordyceps, it was a good stack. Yeah, love it. Yeah, those are great. So, um, Nick, this has just been... Um, really informative. I appreciate all the work that you're doing. Um, how can people connect with you and what's the best way for them to continue seeing what you're doing? Sure. So they can, well, first of all, thanks for hosting me. This has been a blast and I'm looking forward to doing follow-up conversations with yeah. you. And if they want to find my work, they want to connect with me directly, they can go to my website, nickurban.me. And there you'll find the articles that I'm writing, the podcasts I'm recording, the YouTube videos, It'll all be right there. And I also respond to all of the comments I get directly. They're all from me. I don't have my helpers writing comments or responses. So it might take a little while, but I will personally read and get back to everyone who reaches out. I love that. So uh, check out nickurban.me. And Nick, you've got a, a, such an amazing uh, way about you and, and a uniqueness that it is uh, really uh, um, refreshing and I really appreciate uh, the work you're doing. Uh, thanks again for being on the show. And for those of you who love this episode, share it with somebody, um, give us a review. Uh, your five-star review helps other people find the show and hopefully helps them transform their lives. So thanks everybody. Until next time, uh, signing out. Thank you.